and we can start. Fantastic. Well, it's a uh, great pleasure to be here today. I'm, uh, it's, I must confess this is my first Zoom presentation. I've uh, resisted these kind of things up to now. But uh, it's a, a wonderful pleasure to be here, and in particular, a very humbling um, situation. I see many, many people in the audience who know very much more about these subjects than I do myself. So I apologize in advance. This is uh, a, a topic, a talk about a topic that I'm not an expert on, but uh, one that I've gained a lot of inspiration from uh, many of you in the audience. So the topic is Hargrove CFT, a microscopic approach. So this really began, I guess, 2016 for me personally, when I uh, was speaking to Vaughan Jones at the beach and he uh, told me about subfactors. And that was the first really that I had heard of subfactors and uh, I, mean, I guess I'd been aware of them distantly, but that was my first encounter with subfactors and my first real uh, sense that there's something really deep and amazing going on there. I mean, he, he, when he explained uh, the, the, the results on type two one factors and so on, I was uh, amazed at the intricate combinatorics that, that came out of this, the study of these, these things. And uh, also he very persuasively made the case that subfactors should have something to do with physics. And uh, well, I was immediately on board and I found that quite inspirational. And in a sense, um, I feel like that, that's kind of obvious, right? That subfactors have something to do with physics. So uh, to explain, I'm a physicist uh, and I'm approaching these objects that, you are, that are being studied in the subfactor literature from the outside as a physicist, really hunting as a tool to make predictions in physics and also sort of hunt and gather interesting things to look for in physics. And I, I was quickly convinced that subfactors really do have something to do with physics, with interesting physics. And the paper that for me uh, it emphasized that fact, the best was one by Elifman and Benzel in 2007, where they construct uh, a, what, from, from our perspective, from this sort of quantum information condensed matter perspective, a very natural uh, way to, to build subfactors from what I would call spin chains. And uh, I mean, this is obviously known to, to many practitioners, but I, I found that, that that particular paper is a sort of jumping off point. But of course, if you, if you push further, I mean, you know, you, you're not interested in just subfactors in physics, you really want a slightly more fine-grained um, uh, definition of the word physics here. And the, the, the idea that's been floating around the community, I think my understanding is that it sort of started in the early 70s and has been the result of a tremendous amount of work by, by, by mathematicians in the past decades. There's this idea that there's somehow a correspondence between subfactors on one side and physics in the form of quantum field theories or perhaps um, more specifically, conformal field theories on the other. So there should be some kind of correspondence between these two, 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 two things. And, uh, and the interesting thing, like the really fascinating thing from a physicist's perspective, is that uh, this correspondence isn't completely mapped out. And that there are, in particular, sort of missing, missing pieces in this, this proposed correspondence. And in particular, there's a subfactor uh, called the Hargrove subfactor which should have morally a CFT associated with it on the physics side. And so when, when you hear that as a physicist, you, you know, that's a really uh, fascinating conjecture because you know, what that sounds like, that sounds like a prediction of, of a new physical theory from, from mathematics. And uh, you know, from that moment, I was kind of hooked. And uh, that's really the motivation behind this talk. So uh, when, when we say CFT, we, we just have to, well, firstly, what is this Hargrove subfactor? In case you're not familiar with it, the Hargrove subfactor is the first irreducible finite depth subfactor with Jones index uh, greater than four. Uh, you can uh, find the details in this paper of Asaida and Hargrove in 99. And, and on the other side of this correspondence, we have things called CFTs, right? So what do we mean by CFT in this talk? Well, um, there's a various number of ways you can attack the, the, the problem of understanding what is a CFT. Uh, one is you could use a vertex operator algebra, or you could use the Siegel formulation or conformal nets. Um, I'm going to do none of these things, right? Uh, I'm going to take a much more concrete down to earth approach to understanding what is a CFT. So I'm going to give you the full sort of dirty, uh, ugly mess that, that physicists would 
associate with CFTs. And the way we attack CFTs is from uh, lattice systems approaching uh, quantum phase transitions. I'll explain that later. So just to warn you, I'm going to uh, define CFTs as none of these things on this slide. Uh, another way you could attack CFTs that, that Vaughan uh, somewhat recently uh, tried was to use, to define CFTs or obtain rather, is better the right way to say it now. CFTs are somehow unitary representations of Thomson's group uh, T. Uh, that way of attacking uh, the definition of CFT hasn't really sort of panned out yet, but, um, and there's a lot of obstructions. So uh, I'll just leave that as a side remark as, as I think. So really, uh, if we want to attack this problem of building a CFT corresponding to this beautiful mathematical object of the Hargrove subfactor, we need some way of doing it. And you know, a bunch of people have tried actually, and uh, I, I understand that it, it's sort of, we're not yet at a satisfactory situation. Maybe someone in the audience might know better than me now that the state of the art. But the, the, it feels like you know, we have a bunch of things that haven't quite worked yet, and we kind of like tried all the simple things, and now we're stuck with like, the, hard, the hard way of getting at a CFT. And this hard way is what Vaughan calls the royal road, which is to build a, somehow a Hargrove microscopic model, some model of physics, some lattice model of physics, and search around for a second order quantum phase transition. And that's what should then deliver a, with a scaling limit, a conformal field theory. Um, and here, it's very important to, to have a bit of insight from the physicist side that scaling limits of second order phase transitions are what we pretty much say are synonymous with conformal field theory. So this is not at all rigorous, okay? I, I, you know, I have to openly admit this is um, collected intuition, let's say, and it usually works. But so when I say a CFT from now on, I'm likely gonna be thinking not of a VOA or anything like that, but really of a scaling limit of a second order phase transition. So I'll explain precisely what that, or as precisely as I can, what that means presently. Okay, here's a quick overview of how one might get from subfactors to this uh, second order scaling limits. Um, it's kind of like a to-do list, uh, a roadmap of, of ways you might get from subfactors on one end right down to the scaling limits on the other. And this is gonna roughly give you a sense of the ideas that we've been trying in the past five years and uh, four, four or five years. So, you know, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take subfactors and really think of them as fusion categories with algebra objects. That's sort of the, that just makes it a bit more tractable for us combinatorially to approach these physically. Uh, and then at this point, you have really a lot of options um, uh, to build uh, systems which might give you a CFT in the end. And the one option that, that I'll pursue in this talk is this notion of a golden chain due to many authors, including Feigwin, Kitaev, uh, Zhenghan Wang, and Mike Friedman, amongst others. Uh, and you, this is a really specific prescription for how to build a microscopic model that should, should morally give us a CFT. That's the, uh, the approach we'll take in, in this talk, to go down that road, but there's another way. You can actually build a thing called 11 Wen Stringnet model, uh, and then you can uh, attack it by something called a strange correlator, and then hopefully, uh, maybe with the introduction of defects, uh, you might be able to build something that has some kind of conformal invariance, perhaps by discrete polymorphicity or some other mechanism that eventually somehow through some sort of good luck and fortune gives you a CFT at the end. Okay, so where am I on this, this roadmap? Where are we on this roadmap? And I forgot to say at the beginning um, that to thank my co-authors, you saw the list on the right. This really, uh, this is joint work of many, many people now. And, and I, the list grows and grows so as more people uh, get inspired in this problem and, and have, have a go at it. Um, uh, but so where are we? Well, we're somewhere at building this golden chain thingy that I'll explain presently. Um, we know how to add defects into these things and we hope that we somehow have an idea of how to find conformal uh, invariance in these things and potentially conformal field theories. There's a lot of missing steps. And in order not to build unnecessary suspense, we have not yet found a conformal field theory associated with a Hargrove subfactor, and all evidence points to the negative so far. So there's uh, unfortunately no no uh, no uh, good clues yet that I can offer. I'm still hopeful uh, that something will turn up. But I, all I'll do for the, today is give you a report on this red path of ideas. 
Okay, let's get to the actual, the nature of the beast itself. So when we talk about the Hargrove subfactor, actually, I'm not going to talk about the Hargrove subfactor. The way we're going to approach the problem of building a CFT associated with the Hargrove subfactor is rather to talk about an associated fusion category, the eight, what we call the H3 fusion category. Uh, it's a fusion category. It has six simple objects. Here's their names, one alpha, alpha star rho, alpha rho, and alpha star rho. They have this particular, these particular fusion rules. There is an algebra object you can build. Uh, it's a little bit intricate, takes a couple of pages. Um, and that's the way in which we're going to uh, use the data of the, the hybrid subfactor, namely as a, a fusion category with algebra objects. Um, and the first step is to take this, this data of a fusion category, unitary fusion category, and to somehow build a quantum mechanical system that we can then hopefully, by hook or by crook, extract a conformal field theory out of. To build a quantum mechanical system, we need two things. We need to specify the kinematics, which is otherwise known as the Hilbert space. And we also need to talk about the dynamics, which is otherwise known as the Hamiltonian. And then we have to solve the Hamiltonian and go down this royal road of Vaughan Jones to then somehow extract a conformal field theory. Uh, we're some ways away uh, down this road, but certainly not at the end. So to commence this talk, really, I'll, in the first, say, 15 minutes or so, I want to tell you about the kinematics the Hilbert space that we're using to discuss the, or to build or attack or approach this high group CFT. So it all commences with a particular basis of a home space. So we're talking about a fusion category here. We have these home spaces and we're going to focus on home spaces generated by the object rho in the hard the high group H3 category. Now, in particular, we've got these home spaces where we are associated with rho fused M times to rho fused N times. That's some complex vector space. And here's a pretty nice basis that uh, physicists are very fond of uh, to actually uh, parameterize elements of this particular home space. And it's called the fusion tree basis. How do you build it? Well, you take rho, you fuse on rho, there's various fusion outcomes, and you look at various, uh, you select out the various fusion outcomes, call them y1, y2, y3, and so on, until you get to the, z to the middle of this fusion tree. And then you have some uh, object, Z, and then you undo it uh, and to get to N copies of rho. So that's an example of a fusion tree. And this is one element of this complex vector space. And we're going to span this complex vector space with these fusion trees that all offer them. So we're talking about finite dimensional vector spaces here at the moment. So M and N are finite. And really, this home space is, has, has within it, if you like, the, the kinematics, the, the Hilbert space of the system that we're going to build. And here is the system we're going to build. So uh, it's going to be, I've called it the H3 golden chain after the, the, the title of this paper cited below by, by uh, Feigun et al. Uh, and what, what is the kinematics? Well, what you do is you just take the home space uh, where we have uh, the simple object one trivial object, the home space one to rho fused n plus two time. So that's that's a vector space, perfectly fine vector space. And uh, we're going to declare that that's the kinematical space for our system. Now, physically, we're thinking about this as a chain of anions. So if you're familiar with this kind of um, nomenclature, then you know we're thinking about a chain of really rho is a physical particle and we're thinking about a chain of them in, in a line and how many are there well n plus two and the kinematics of this particular quantum system is given by this particular home space now uh, just to sort of simplify the notation somewhat we're going to associate to every such fusion uh, tree a ket a, a vector so this is a physicist notation uh, and we parameterize each of these fusion trees with this 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 ket notation x1 through to xn minus 1, where each of these x's comes from uh, one of these six simple objects here. And uh, they have, there's some additional combinatorial constraints on what, what sequence of x1s and x2s and so on are allowed. Uh, and that's got to do with the fusion rules and is completely determined thereby. So we have this, 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 this home space. This is a uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space. And it's therefore isomorphic to C to the D for some D. D scales in a very fast way with N. And that's it, right? We're done. 
that was in fact the kinematics of our system. So what we're thinking of here is it sort of, this it should be clear, I hope that there's one parameter at the moment and that is N, right? N is just the number of anions that we fuse together. And so we've got a really not just one kinematical Hilbert space, but in fact, a, a sequence of N of these, right? Just pick N and you've got a bigger one. Once you have a Hilbert space, it's time to, to give it life, to breathe life into the Hilbert space. And you do that by, by introducing a Hamiltonian, an energy scale into the problem. Now, for a system, a quantum mechanical system, there's generally, you know, if you insist on many, many invariances, um, there's usually, you know, only a handful of what you would call natural Hamiltonians that you can build. But for these, this is a, an example of a microscopic model, a model to do with microscopic things, right? Things at the Planck scale or maybe things at the, I don't know, the Angstrom scale or something, right? So these chains are admittedly hypothetical and difficult to realize in physics, but uh, you, you, we, they're very dirty and messy because they're, they're comprised of many, 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 many little, little particles. And to breathe life into this, we need a Hamiltonian. And it's not just in, in, in contrast to quantum field theory where you, you impose lots and lots of symmetries. Here, we don't really have many symmetries to impose. And uh, there are many possible Hamiltonians we could write down, like uh, exponentially many parameter sized Hamiltonians we could write down here. Um, I, can, I see a couple of questions in the chat. I'll just quick, oh, it's already been answered by Emily. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, the H, uh, how are we going to build a Hamiltonian for this, this, this system, right? We're going to need some, a Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. Uh, how do you get Hermitian operators? Well, you, Hermitian matrices, right? So there's a zillion Hermitian matrices we could define, but we, from the physicist's perspective, there, there are actually more natural ones than others. You know, there are Hermitian matrices that when we put that, that or when we solve them, we expect them, they're more likely to give us a uh, quantum phase transition and hence hopefully a slip. And I'm gonna show you a way to, to build these, these particularly nice Hamiltonians due to uh, this golden chain paper. And it all starts with the idempotents. So what we're going to talk about uh, to be, uh, for a couple of slides now are the idempotents of, the, of this H3 fusion category. And in particular, the idempotents in the home space H rho fusion rho to uh, rho fusion rho. And the first idempotent is this one here. So uh, you take rho, fuse it with rho, uh, project onto the outcome one, and then unfuse. So that's an idempotent. Uh, then uh, here's another one, okay? And in fact, it turns out there are four natural idempotents in this home space here, associated to the four objects, one rho, alpha rho, and alpha star rho. So with these four idempotents in hand, I'm gonna now uh, explain how to build a natural Hermitian matrix that uh, may possibly give rise to a, uh, to a quantum phase transition and then perhaps potentially a conformal. So the main problem now is to find a way to get this uh, matrix, let's say one of these idempotents, to act on this much bigger home space here, this, this vector space that we've introduced earlier, this kinematical Hilbert space. How do we get a, two, a, a box that goes from two copies of rho to two copies of rho to act on this bigger space? Well, it's you know the simplest, naivest thing to do is to let it do nothing on every row except for the j and the j plus one. You know, you just allow the box to act trivially on the remaining uh, simple objects. So we introduce this operator here, which I've called PJZ. PJZ is built from the idempotent simply by putting identity strands on all the uh, other uh, row objects, except for the J and the J plus one. And so that way, from an idempotent, we can build a family of uh, idempotents. PJZ is also an idempotent. And, uh, and there, from this, we're going to build a uh, Hamilton. Uh, and this, physicists like this particular kind of idempotent um, because it's local. So it expresses a, a very key and important fact in physics, you know, that physics should be local. Uh, and uh, what does this mean? Well, it means that, you know, particles, anions in this case, these rows, should only interact with each other uh, to their neighbors, so to speak. So PJZ naturally already captures that, that, that idea. PJZ is an operator, it's an idempotent, it's a Hermitian matrix in this, on this Hilbert space, on the vector space. Now there's a lot of these PJZs, right? There's in fact uh, N of them, and or N plus one of them, 
yes? Uh, and uh, that'll turn out to be important when we build the golden chain homophonia. Now, one key, uh, so I see a question in the chat, does the one dimensionality of this chain come from the Hamiltonian or something else? Ah, that's a good question, right? You know, this is, this is a vector space so far, right? Um, I've, uh, I've, I've drawn it like this one dimensional thing uh, there, you know, it looks like a one dimensional thing, but it's just a vector space. You know, wh where does the word one dimensional come from? Um, why do I say chain? Well, as you, as you say uh, in the, question, does it come from the Hamiltonian? The answer is yes. You know, when I write down the Hamiltonian eventually, then that will bake in this kind of what is spatial one dimensionality into the system. So how do these idempotents act on this, this, this vector space? Uh, well, as matrices. So here's their action um, as a matrix on these, these basis vectors, these fusion vectors. And uh, how do we, in fact, work out, you know, it's, more, it's not enough just to know that there's a matrix there. We need to work out matrix elements if we want to diagonalize this matrix. And there's a, a, a the trick to working out how to uh, calculate the matrix elements of uh, one of these idempotents on this particular uh, basis vector is you should fuse the pairs that you are going to act on uh, and then apply an F move six J symbols to rewrite that fusion of the Jth and the J plus one pair uh, as a first fusing the neighboring um, labels, X J minus one and X J plus one to some intermediate fusion outcome. And then you have the rows and then it's really clear how this item potent acts, right? It's just really as a, as a projection. So in particular, to write down this matrix, this, this, this golden chain Hamiltonian for this vector space, we're going to need the six J symbols for this HP fusion probability. Now, uh, my computer has frozen for some reason. I oh, know, here it goes. So we need these six J symbols. And uh, well, that's not entirely trivial, right? They have been known uh, for a long time, thanks to the work of Izumi. Uh, it's not implicitly, if only it's implicitly via linear equations. Uh, in order to make progress on this, we sort of by brute force work them out ourselves. Um, and just to give you a sense of the kind of numbers that we're talking about when we write down these kind of Hamiltonians and Hermitian matrices, to calculate the F symbols, the six J symbols for the H3 category, we had to solve some 40,000 equations in 1400 variables. Um, and th I mean, certainly we claim no, no prior, uh, priority here on these, these F symbols. They've been known uh, for a long time. Uh, here's, but here we collected them in, I hope, an easy to use format. Here's some examples of, of, of the 6J symbols that you'd need to uh, write down this golden chain Hamiltonian. And note here the, the classical root, uh, root root 13 kind of um, objects that appear all the way through any discussion of the high group subfactor. Um, and we visualized here uh, some of these 6J symbols just with the heat, heat densities. Um, and here, in fact, are all the 6J symbols for the high group fusion category visualized as a little bitmap image there, just listed uh, lexicographically. Um, and indeed, if you want to download the F symbols, uh, there they are. And there's a GitHub link uh, where you can find them. Uh, to, so can, I ask, can I ask something? Um, so th this is for H3 yes. system, right? So, so that's the, the usual uh whole group fusion rules but but but, but the, the, there's another category with the same fusion rules in, in indeed so, yes so well well why does it work for this one and not the other one um I, I guess this is the first one it worked for us so we just haven't looked any further so we should look at the other one it, it, there's no no reason not to look at the other one in fact okay um we just haven't done that yet i think it's the, is the uh, so you're seeing a work in progress and we are H3 is the first one of these fusion categories that we understood. And so uh, we just went from there without looking backwards. But maybe we better start backtracking and looking at the other one. Maybe there's a lesson here. So what I've described now is a bunch of idempotents parameterized by N, the number of uh, these uh, row objects, and also parameterized by J, like the location, if you like, of these neighboring row objects. And 
I've shown you four idempotents. In fact, there's six, right? Uh, but to get the other two, you need to fuse triples of these uh, row objects together. Uh, we haven't gone there yet. Maybe we should also go there, as you'll see. Uh, but given already these four idempotents, we can build a class of uh, Hermitian matrices that we, you know, from the physical side, we would strongly suspect should give us phase transitions, quantum phase transitions, and hence, hopefully, a conformal field theory. And how do we build these? Well, there's this prescription, and this prescription goes like this. You take this pj, z, you associate with it some constant, gamma, z, and then you sum over all the j's from j equals one, 0 to n, and then you sum over all the z's, where z runs from one row, alpha row, and alpha star row. And that gives you a four-parameter family of Hermitian matrices. And due, we would call this a local uh, anion spin chain. And local quantum spin, anion spin chains, have, you know, thanks to decades of experience in condensed metaphysics, have, you know, are typically a good place to look for quantum phase transitions. So I better start getting to, talk, uh, to telling you what is a quantum phase transition. I'll do that in a moment. Just before I do that, I highlight that this is a Hermitian matrix that acts from H n plus 2, the kinematic equivalent space of, of our anions, to H n plus 2. So, uh, the, you know, we have a Hermitian matrix, and really the natural question, if you want to get into uh, solving this physical model, is to look for its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors. Well, that's not going to be very easy, right, because the dimension of this Hilbert space scales exponentially with n. And so at some point, you know, you can try n is 3, 4, 5. At some point, everything's going to become uh, computationally infeasible numerically. So uh, to be clear, our main, main tool here uh, is, in fact, numeric. And so uh, we're going to look for the, the strategy, really, for the rest of the talk is to use approximate numerical methods to not solve this Hamiltonian. We're not going to give a list of all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors that's infeasible for large n. Instead, we're going to simply understand the lowest energy eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So you, we write out, the, we're going to try and approximate the eigenvectors of this Hermitian matrix with the lowest associated eigenvalue. That's the goal. And, we, and already we know from a lot of physical experience that just the first two tell us a lot, can, can really tell us a lot about the physics of these systems and whether or not we expect there to be a quantum phase transition. So we're going to try and take this matrix Hn plus 2 and diagonalize it. That's the strategy, but of course we can't do it in, in, in its full exponential glory. We just really focus on the first two, two eigenstates. So really, we're using this, this matrix as a way to parameterize a family of ground states, if you like, and perhaps, perhaps a, a family of a couple of excited or first uh, uh, of, of additional eigenstates. And we're going to write these ground states as omega n plus 2. So the ground state or the lowest energy eigenstate is omega. And every other one I write as just E with a ket symbol. And uh, a key, really a key um, diagnostic for whether a model like this will give you a quantum phase transition is something called the spectral gap. Very simple. It's just the difference between the lowest eigenvalue and the first uh, eigenvalue above the lowest. And that's a number, right? It's a number. It depends on n and gamma. This list of parameters of gamma. And uh, I now, I'm sort of forced now at this point, I've painted myself into the corner of trying to give you a definition of what is a second order quantum phase transition and hence, um, you know, uh, implicitly what we think of as a CFT. Of course, I'm going to be a little bit sort of sneaky here and not quite give you the definition because I don't think we, it's possible to give a clean definition of what a quantum phase transition is. But what I'm going to do is tell you some features associated with quantum phase transitions and hence give you a diagnostic for when something doesn't have a quantum phase transition. And here is the, 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 the information that we're going to need. Um, but what, what, you know, what, what do we know about quantum phase transitions? Well, they occur at, usually occur at special points in parameter space at so-called critical points in the limit that n tends to infinity, the number of these row objects goes to infinity. So they're somehow associated with infinite dimensional vector spaces. Um, another feature is that they uh, have what's called long range correlations. Um, and that spectral, spectral gap I mentioned before vanishes at this critical point. That's really critical. We, we know this. It's a key feature. And now the search is on, right? We have a, we have a, a, a four parameter family of, of Hermitian matrices and we have some 
features that we want to uh, uh, use as our null hypothesis. Well, actually, our null hypothesis is that the model has no um, quantum phase transition. So, the null, uh, and we're trying to reject that null hypothesis. As it turns out, we cannot reject this null hypothesis in the model that I've written down, but that they come from. And so, we, we've got this, this, this list of, of key features that we hope that our, our Hermitian matrix will have. And we're going to look around the parameter space of these, we can tune gamma around this four parameter space and look for a point which at least shows some of those features. But there's a roadblock, and that is that the Hilbert space that we're working with, this Hn plus two, is it doesn't have the structure of a tensor product of finite dimensional vector spaces. So, uh, I mean, this is a trivial, almost trivial statement in fusion category language, but it's also a huge roadblock from the physical perspective. It means that many of our cherished tools don't directly work, cherished numerical tools don't directly work because they're usually tuned to this tensor product decomposition structure of the, of the Hilbert space. Uh, so, but what we do know, right, is that although the actual kinematical Hilbert space we've built doesn't have the structure of a tensor product, it certainly lives inside a, a bigger vector space that does have this tensor product. We'll call this big, bigger vector space Kf plus two. And we're going to identify uh, our kinematical Hilbert space as a subspace of this bigger, simpler tensor product Hilbert space. And we're going to introduce additional basis vectors and uh, to parameterize those additional dimension, the, the, the additional dimensions of this uh, vector space K plus two. And these basis vectors will be labeled by, again, these so-called fusion paths, these, these strings X1 through to Xn minus one. But now we're going to allow illegal fusions, you know, ones where where uh, it could never have possibly arisen from the fusion category. Um, just a bit of terminology before I, I proceed. We're going to be talking about um, the support of operators. We can do that when we have tensor product structure on our Hilbert space. Uh, we define the support of an operator to be the smallest subset of the, of the, the integers one to n such that a, a matrix A can be written as the tensor product of A on a given set of spins. Or, or, or tensor subfactors, uh, uh, and as the identity on the rest. You just write S for that smallest support. Um, and now, now uh, I'll just also mention the terminology of a local Hamiltonian and, and why, you know, why I've been using this terminology actually. So we define a local Hamiltonian to be a self-adjoint operator of the form of some summation of Hermitian matrices, each of which has a small support. Yeah, each of which has a small support. And it turns out that although the Hargrove H3 Hamiltonian, golden chain Hamiltonian I've introduced does not directly have that structure, uh, it embeds into one that does. So here comes the, the uh, embedded version of, of, this H, of this H3 Hamiltonian. So I built this Hamiltonian with these idempotents. There it is there. And it's pretty straightforward to see that it embeds as a, a Hamiltonian local in the sense that I've just described. Um, by just simply by padding zeros, right? You take the matrix that you had working on the subspace Hn, and then you pad it as zeros on the rest of the dimensions of the Hilbert space K. And just to indicate that there's a difference between the idempotent Pj acting on the subspace and Pj acting on the bigger embedding Hilbert space, we'll call it Qj. And the support of these project, uh, these um, idempotents, these embedded idempotents, is actually three. Each of them acts on only three of these finite dimensional uh, sub uh, tensor factors at a time. So now we have a, a model that acts on a tensor product Hilbert space, and our numerical tools from condensed matter theory that we want to apply in quantum information theory they work much better with tensor product uh, Hilbert spaces. Of course, uh, all, all things aren't all great um, because this matrix allows, you know, it can act on illegal configurations. Here's an example of an illegal configuration. Two alphas next to each other, that's impossible. It's not allowed by the fusion rules of the H3 fusion category. And it turns out the ground state of this matrix that I've written down will exactly have this structure. It's easy. It'll just zoom to one of these illegal configurations and that, that's, that's the lowest energy I can make. So that's a bit dissatisfying. Obviously, we haven't done the right thing. And the reason we haven't done the right thing is we've, we've allowed illegal configurations in this biggest Hilbert space. And I'm going to choose the absolute dumbest, naivest way of, of, um, of stopping this from occurring. And what we're going to do is penalize with the Lagrange multiplier any uh, fusion, any uh, 
vector which lives outside of our allowed Hilbert space. So we're going to choose some constraints CJ that force uh, each of that uh, force this matrix or demand that this matrix acts only on uh, that acts on legal configurations just as before. But if you if you get it to act on a vector an illegal configuration, it'll have a huge number associated with it. And you know what is this? Lagrange multiply lambda, what do we mean by large here? Well, the answer is 10. In, in practice, we've chosen lambda to be 10 and we get fantastic results. Now, uh, these constraints that force the matrix to act um, or penalize the action of this matrix on illegal configurations, these constraint terms actually have support too. They only act on pairs of, of these spins at a time. So in the end, we've, uh, uh, we've written down here a, uh, a Hermitian matrix that's local. So each term in the Hermitian matrix acts on only three or two uh, annuals at a time. And uh, hopefully, uh, and definitely you know, on, on the allowed subspace of, of H3 fusion paths, it, it acts just as the original matrix, and it acts. It has a large penalty associated to it, the action on an illegal subspace, and it acts on a tensor product, a vector space with a tensor product structure. So this is pretty great because this is a perfect object to apply the tools of tensor networks to, the numerical tools of tensor networks to, to uh, obtain approximations to the ground state and low-lying energy excited states of this model. And to explain this numerical method, uh, we're going to have to mention the words tensor networks here. I will give you a brief whirlwind tour. I see that I have some 10 minutes left. Um, so what I'll do is zoom through a couple of the words associated with tensor networks and then give you a little you know, overview of the numerical results we've obtained so far, and in particular, the negative numerical results we've obtained. So I can't really do justice to the, the, the topic of tensor networks. Really, it's now the topic of workshops, and summer schools. Um, but here's a, you know, a brief overview of this, this very powerful numerical method that's been developed in the condensed metal world during the past you know, decade. So you should think of tensor networks as, as just efficient parameterizations of ground states in vector spaces with, with the tensor product structure. And a tensor network is built from a tensor network atom, and an, an atom of a tensor network is an n-index tensor, and an n-index tensor, for the purposes of this talk, is just literally a list of complex numbers. Nothing, none of these differential geometry tensors here, no, no, you know, manifolds here. It's just a list of numbers. Go, and uh, we have a graphical uh, language associated with these tensors, which is you know, obviously familiar to anyone with a background in, in category theory. Or not theory, we just associate a blob with n legs to a, one of these n index tensors. And um, you know, it's important to say that one of these n index tensors is, is parameterized by a number of numbers. In particular, uh, it, it takes you know, the product of the, the dimensions of all these vector spaces associated with these legs, a uh, number of parameters to specify one of these, these n index tensors. And uh, once you've got one of these atoms, what do you do? Well, you, you stick them together to build bigger molecules, right? And, and the, the, the way you stick atoms together in tensor network world is you just do contraction. And that's li literally summing over repeated indices to build bigger tensors. Graphically, a contraction looks like this. You take two common legs and sum over, uh, you join them, and you sum over the common uh, uh, indexes into the, into the tensors, thus producing a bigger tensor. Here's a couple of example tensors just to get you, you know, familiar examples. Vectors, which is one leg tensors. Matrices are two leg tensors. Multiplying a matrix times a vector is this contraction here. Gives you a vector as a consequence. And inner products, which give you numbers, are just two vectors contracted against each other. And a tensor network then is nothing but an n index tensor built from the contraction of a list of these, these tensors. So a big molecule built from these atoms. Here's an example of a tensor network, blob with five legs. If you look under the hood, what do you see? You see a bunch of, of uh, n-index tensors that have been contracted together in some crazy pattern. That's a tensor network. Uh, an important, uh, I will skip over the notion of a bond dimension and instead get to what is a tensor network state. A tensor network state is a 
vector in a tensor product Hilbert space, such as our Kn Hilbert space, which is built, whose coefficients, when you expand it in some convenient basis, uh, are associated with a tensor network. So you take this, you write this vector as a sum over a basis vectors. You now have the coefficients psi j1 through to jn minus 1. That's an n, n, n minus 1 index tensor. Uh, you can then write that n index tensor, if you please, as a uh, contraction of, of these at it tensor product atoms. The most powerful uh, tensor network unsets that we've been experimenting with in the condensed matter world for many, many years is that, uh, a, is that a particular tensor network which has this graphical structure here. It's comprised of three index and two index tensors contracted in this particular linear fashion here. And we use these as a variational class. And here's some terminology associated to these tensor networks. We talk about physical legs, bonds, and virtual legs. So the uncontracted legs, the ones that are associated with the actual um, coefficients of a vector, who are physical legs, the virtual legs are the ones that are contracted. There's a bunch of properties that these things have that are very attractive and, and give us you know, the, the main uh, tool that we have to apply them to studying these kinds of local uh, models that, that, we've, um, that I've been talking about so far. Uh, they are parameterized by a relatively tame number of parameters, polynomially growing in the size of the system. Uh, they allow the efficient computation of expectation values, and they give good reproduction of, of quantum correlations and entanglement, a, a feature that's really key for um, studying quantum phase transitions. These particular ones have a so-called exponential decaying correlation functions that won't be so relevant here. Um, a key Theorem, a proposition that really cements these matrix product states in the study of local Hamiltonians is this one due to, to really to Matt Hastings originally, but refined a great deal in, in subsequent years. And that is that this is the one that gives us the reason to believe that matrix product states are a useful tool in studying local quantum spin systems such as the one we have here. And then it, it, it reads the follows. Let omega n plus one be the ground state of a geometrically one-dimensional Hamiltonian n h n plus two with spectral gap, right? Remember that spectral gap that I spoke earlier about? Then there exists a matrix product state, blah, which well approximates this ground state with some, some particular scaling of some parameters here. So this is the reason to be for these, these matrix product states. And it's the key diagnostic that we're going to apply to find out when something doesn't have a, a quantum phase transition. Because you note here, the system has a spectral gap. That means this delta E is not zero in the limit that it tends to infinity. In that limit, there is a good approximation by a matrix product state to the ground state. Okay, if that, if you, therefore, if you find a good approximation with a matrix product state to your system, then it's not at a quantum phase transition. That's the, uh, that's the way to read this. And that's the diagnostic that we're going to, that's the way we're going to use this result as a diagnostic. If there does exist an MPS, uh, which well approximates the ground state, then K n plus two is not critical. And therefore does not have a quantum phase transition and has no hope of giving us a conformal field theory. Here's the, to remind you, uh, and now, now we come to the results, right? So I think I'll look at the time here. So it's a quarter past six. Um, and so uh, I can, I've got time to explain these results. So what have we done? We've taken this, this Hamiltonian that I introduced earlier in the talk, and we've numerically uh, analyzed it with these matrix product states, and we have found that for various values of these parameters that parameterize this Hamiltonian, that a matrix product state does a very good job of approximating its ground state, and therefore the system is not critical. So let me now give you a laundry list of, of models we've tried, uh, which aren't critical and therefore have no hope of giving us a uh, conformal field theory associated to the high group subfactor. Okay, here's the original and best. This is the golden chain Hamiltonian itself as manifested in the high group uh, context. We take as for our Hamiltonian, the, the one that's comprised of a list of idempotents associated with the trivial object one, uh, summed along this chain. It's a one dimensional chain. We've added this constraint lambda cj to ensure that uh, we lie within the legal subspace. And we numerically studied that with this matrix product state tensor network routine. And 
what did we find? Did we find that the uh, matrix product states did a poor job? No, unfortunately not. We found that the matrix product states did a fantastic job of explaining the uh, physics of these models. So now what I should point out, one, one thing that we were initially very excited by was when we studied this model for n is like three, four, five, right? You, you, these are big matrices when n is three, four, and five. You can do it though. You can you put it into MATLAB and diagonalize the matrix. You get a full list of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Forget matrix product states, just exactly diagonalize it. If you do that, then it looks extremely, it looks extremely suggestive. It it's, sort of looks like a, it's got a corner phase transition, this model. And we were very excited. We thought this is it. We, we, it's going to be easy. We're going to write down this model. It'll give us a corner phase transition done. But when you scale n up very large, the phase transition vanishes. And this plot here is meant to indicate that information. So uh, if this system had a quantum phase transition, this quantity, which I've called entanglement entropy up there, should grow and grow and grow and grow as the system gets bigger or equivalently the super combination grows. It does not. So this model, the simplest possible analog of this golden chain model is for the Hargrove H3 fusion category is not critical and therefore will not have a, a conformal field theory associated. Bummer. Okay, so whatever. Don't give up, right? Let's try another one. And so we tried this as our next uh, attempt. We, we There's this algebra object associated with the fusion category. We haven't used it yet. Maybe we should use it. So uh, the algebra object is one plus rho plus alpha rho. Um, one way to build a subfactor here. And we built this Hamiltonian associated sort of morally to that algebra object. Um, studied it. Boom. Okay. Also, extremely disappointing results. In fact, this model is also absolutely not in any sense critical. Indeed, uh, you can then get sort of ambitious and start saying, well, you know, that's just one point in this four dimensional parameter space. Why don't we just explore all the parameters? I mean, it's four dimensions. Okay. You can't do that efficiently, but you can just choose random points in this four dimensional uh, manifold. I keep solving these models, trying to look for points which might be critical. And we've been doing that. Well, it's actually a three-dimensional parameter space because there's an overall scaling. Uh, we've been doing that over the past months, and we have not found a single point in this parameter space which could ever lead to a conformal field theory. So, so far, the, um, the news ain't good. Uh, this, these, this particular approach here uh, hasn't led yet to a discovery of a model which exhibits a quantum phase transition for the Hargrove uh, associated to the Hargrove subfactor. So I'd say that the search really goes on. Um, and with that, I am done. And thank you very much for your time. And I'm looking very much forward to uh, discussing further. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. So I'll stop the recording.